Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Richard, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. This is your, I think, fourth time, fifth time on, but I wanted to have you on to discuss on this special day, because you know what today is? It's just ironic we're recording it on President's Day. It won't be out on President's Day, but yeah. Let's talk about the the presidential decree. Uh, what does it mean to be president, and what have we learned about the behind the scenes of what our presidential people have, our presidents have? What does it mean to be president? Oh, my God, what a question. Well, it meant a, a, it meant a lot different things to the founders than it does today, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, uh, they talk about taking, uh, taking presidents off the ballot and stuff nowadays, but not all the states voted for Washington. Some of them, they were still in the protest period where they were switching from uh, the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, and a lot of states hadn't ratified the Constitution yet, and so they refused to vote in that election for Washington. He was not elected by 13 states. I forget the numbers, but there was a handful of states that did not vote in that election. Washington was elected without being on the ballot in every state, or even being in the election in every state. And they still elected him. That's how we got George Washington. And he had an opponent, too, uh, that you never hear about. It's an, it, Yeah, research that. Look that up. The, the presidential election of um, 1889. I mean, 1789. I wanted to have you on to discuss some things that have been mentioned to me in the past by other JFK researchers, which has been focusing more on the Johnson did it angle and some other areas I've kind of neglected. I don't think that he was involved. I think he was part of the cover-up, 100%. But I think when it came to you know being able to manipulate and really get the plan in motion and all these things, I couldn't... I mean, there's so many people that you could really choose upon about who could possibly be it. But I'm just curious, from your perspective of being born and raised in Texas, what you know about figures that have a relation to Texas. I've been getting very interested in the Dallas police um, specifically because I believe that a lot of their stuff can boil down to wanting to protect their conviction rates. And Oswald was just one of those that were being wrongfully persecuted. Yeah. Well, okay. Let's unpack a little bit of this. Uh, yeah. I've heard you say before, you don't think LBJ was involved. Um, I sort of agree with that. He was not a plotter. He was not, he knew what was going to happen. I think as far, I think there were several conspiracies working. Uh, and they all, some of them got put aside. Some of them were told to step, step down so that the, what we call the CIA's conspiracy could take over the deep states conspiracy could take take the final run uh there was there were mob figures jimmy hoffa and those guys they wanted to kill kennedy this goes way back uh on there was word on the street in 62 uh around the time of marilyn monroe's death uh there was word on the street that in the mob that they were going to kill kennedy and that was coming out of Marcello and New Orleans and, you know, all those guys that, you know, were involved with the CIA. Sure, they were. Uh, may have even given them the idea because they were, they thought they were trying to kill Castro and they were, they were taking missions and going after him. They had experience, but they knew who they were working for and all that. But maybe, you know, they also had their hits going on, their contracts. So somebody got the idea, Marcello got the idea, we got to kill Kennedy, uh, get the pebble out of my shoe, he said. And uh, there, were, there were other plots going on, uh, I'm sure, um, that either were in interconnected or not. So you say that, but somehow the alternative plots or the other assassination attempts get chalked up to a conspiracy. And I think it's because I think what some of those records are destroyed 
um, like the Chicago plot and things like that get lumped into the conspiracy realm when you're dealing in a discussion on either the forums of the JFK assassination, which I wouldn't recommend, but I think it's, I thought it was proven, but it's really hard to find documentation on it, whether it was destroyed or not. You grab, I've noticed this in several episodes that you've gravitated back to whenever you say the conspiracy, that's a conspiracy, that's the conspiracy realm. You're using the word as if it's not something real. You're using the word as if it's a fantasy. Let's get our definition straight. A conspiracy, whenever you use the word conspiracy, you're talking about something that's real. It has a definition. You know, uh, somebody distracts you in a crowd and another guy picks your pocket. Uh, Rich, that's I'm, a conspiracy. I'm, I'm well aware of the legal definition of real conspiracies. That's why we have a whole d department that investigate criminal conspiracies. It can be tried in court. But what I use it for is because a lot of the public doesn't know that. So it's the easiest way to get people on board to understanding or getting them to the basis without having a full 20-minute discussion or tangent off of the original point. Sorry, I'm not going along with the public on that. Um, if it's not real, it's a fantasy. If it's real, it's a conspiracy. So, But what you're happen happening to talk about is a conspiracy. Um, the Chicago plot was a conspiracy. Uh, it's yeah. So there's only there's only two theories in the Kennedy assassination: Oswald alone or conspiracy. Those are the only two theories. People talk about all the conspiracy theories. That's propaganda. That's to mess with your head. There are only two conspiracies: Oswald or conspiracy. And we know which one it is. We know it wasn't Oswald. We know it was a conspiracy. It was just one conspiracy. Although there were others in operation, but they all got either set aside or congealed into one. Only one conspiracy killed Kennedy. And we know that. We've known that from the beginning. Uh, so when we talk about cons conspiracies, plural, that's my first red flag, that you're misdefining conspiracy. And you're not talking about the Kennedy assassination. You're talking about whatever, some fantasy that you've heard about or, or had. Uh, I want to talk about the conspiracy, the one that killed Kennedy, the one and only that killed Kennedy. Um, and LBJ, you know, you got to go back to 1960. He ran against Kennedy in the primaries, talking about presidents and primaries. He ran against Kennedy. He wanted to be president. Johnson always wanted to be president. He was obsessed with the idea. Um, <laughs> Nixon, of course, was running as a Republican in the Republican primary against uh, Kennedy. Nixon was, he thought he was the sure thing. He thought he was in. You know, this Kennedy kid, he's no, he's no real threat. That didn't develop till later. That's kind of happening this year, too. This year is a very retro kind of election for me. But that aside, LBJ, you know, people at that level of power knew about Kennedy's um, illness. He had a... Um, a Addison's disease. It wasn't actually Addison's disease. A lot of people call it that. But a lot of people will, will jump on you if you call it that. Because it wasn't Addison's disease specifically, it, but it was an adrenal deficiency. Sort of borderline maybe might have developed into Addison's maybe, but technically not Addison's. It was an adrenal deficiency, though, that endangered his life. And I've, I've read that... Um, he knew that he probably, and a lot of people knew that he probably wouldn't live uh, through uh, one term, if not two terms. He certainly wouldn't live through two terms. And he knew that, and his family knew that, uh, which is why he, he tried to get a lot done really fast and pissed a lot of people off that, didn't, that wanted the status quo. He was trying to change the status quo. And, you know, I find that believable. Um, people with an adrenal deficiency like that, uh, they, uh, if you get injured, if you, it doesn't have to be a fatal wound. If you get injured, you have to have cortisone shots in emergency right away. Even if you like cut yourself or you're bleeding in any way, you have to get a cortisone shot to just to survive. You will die without the cort. Would you, if you're, if your own adrenaline is not doing its right thing and taking over, 
uh, you can die from just a simple uh, non-life-threatening injury. So the assassins knew this, as a matter of fact, and that's why they put his personal doctor, the only guy in Dallas, uh, besides maybe Jack, but the only medical guy in Dallas that knew about his adrenal deficiency and had and always carried the cortisone with him was Dr. Berkeley, Dr. George Berkeley, Kennedy's personal physician. Well, over at Love Field, when they landed and they were getting the motorcade together, and there was all the chaos of that, which by itself was a red flag. Berkeley ended up on the VIP VIP bus at the very back of the motorcade, probably on purpose, most likely on purpose. I wrote an essay about that, the late arrival of Dr. Berkeley. Um, and so he was late getting to Parkland. That was all very fuzzy. They 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 made that look like. In order to protect his reputation, they made it look like he got there kind of on time, uh, within, you know, five minutes of the shooting. No, no, no. They were already pronouncing Kennedy dead by the time Berkeley arrived. And that's provable by building the chronology that, that I built in that essay. Um, you got to talk about, at least explain a bit about the essay. You can't just mention the essay. Uh, it's on Substack. Uh, Okay, people don't click on things to read it, so you just got to kind of explain it. Well, what I did was, this was the very first essay, essay that I ever wrote. And uh, I didn't do a very good job of it. I had, to, I had to correct it. When Jack White jumped on me and told me, showed me some errors that I had in it, uh, I had to correct it in a letter to the editor. This was in the... Uh, last issue of the third decade, Jerry Rose's journal. And then the correction, the long letter correcting it was in the first issue of the fourth decade, because he switched the name of it every decade. And um, so it's um, about the late arrival of Dr. Berkeley. He was uh, a Secret Service agent. Uh, I discovered the name of the Secret Service agent by rereading Manchester's death of a president, who told Berkeley, in all the chaos at Love Field, told Berkeley, oh, oh, just go ahead and get on the press bus. And so he did. Berkeley himself didn't piece this all together till much later. Um, but even he hid the fact that he arrived late at, at Parkland Hospital. There's film of him arriving. Um, I have clips of those films. Uh, that I illustrated the essay with in, on Substack. I have stills showing the chronology of the cars. You know, the, the film cameras, the news cameras are there at Parkland at the time everybody's arriving there. Um, and they're filming everybody's arrival. There's a, there's a picture of uh, Deary Cavill, um, Earl Cavill's wife. Earl Cavill rushes into emergency, tells Deary Cavill, his wife, stay in the car. They're in a convertible and she's sitting there all dressed up with her hat on in the car. And she just sits there looking around. And so they have film of everybody's arrival. And by reading when everybody said they arrived and the whole chronology, you can piece that together from testimony. Uh, and then you can watch the film and you can see, okay, there's so-and-so, there's that car, there's this car. They were, they, uh, were cleaning out the limo they were getting the pieces of the top of the limo out of the back of the trunk uh, and started to assemble it there, right there as a timeline you, that you can follow. And you can see which cars are there when they start. You can see which cars are there when they end. Cars are coming and going. And you can piece together this chronology. Well, in the middle of this chronology, you know, with certain cars here, certain cars there, certain pieces of the top placed on the limo, by these activities, you see Berkeley's arrival. They filmed Berkeley's arrival in a little white sedan. And he and his assistant get out of the car, has his bag, and they, they walk around the car and rush into the emergency room. And they walk right by the limo as they're going in. And you can see the guy still putting the top on the car as he's walking in. So you know you have an exact time at that moment of when he arrived. And, you know, I don't want to... It was late. It was like at least it was at least a quarter to one uh, at the earliest. Uh, but that's also by reading the doctor's testimony. I also discovered 
that's you know they'd already been working on them for they they knew pretty quickly that they were just going through the motions because he was he was not going to serve. They were keeping him alive uh, with all all the uh, intravenal and all the the mask and the oxygen and all. They were just keeping his heart going, uh, but there was no brain activity, of course. And so they knew what they were doing. They had his brain leaking out the back onto the floor and onto the stretcher. Uh, so they were just going through the motions by a quarter till. By the time Berkeley arrives, they were getting ready to call it, uh, to call his death, renounce his death. That's when they started saying, oh, we got to get a priest in here. We got to give him last rites. So they delayed it further, of course. But Berkeley did not get there before a quarter to one. And that's very late because they needed that cortisone. And he walks in with his bag and he pulls out, he says he pulled out the quarter, cortisone, gave it to the doctor in order to give it to Kennedy, which he says is what happened. Maybe because they were waiting for the priest, maybe they went through that motion. But that would have been way too late anyway, because even if Kennedy had not been fatally wounded, even if it had not been the head wound, if it had just been like the throat wound, and we know he he lived through that throat wound because he was, you know, reacting to it in the car. Um, and he he that may have been a survivable wound. You know, they could go in there, they could, you know, take care of the the lung damage or whatever was going on. And he might have survived it, but not without the cortisone. Uh, they didn't take any chances. Uh the name of the the name of the essay is certain death, because that's what that plan was about. You get we get Berkeley and his cortisone shots out of the picture, so he can't get there at the beginning of the emergency procedures to give him the cortisone. Then all we have to do is wound Kennedy. Uh, you know, you know we'll take our shots, we'll try to kill him, but all we got to do is wound him. So they didn't take any chances. He took no chances at all by getting Berkeley out of the picture. All they had to do was wound him, and he was dead. Um, and uh, so, she, well, have it, you tried to look into who organized that plan? Like, could it just be just a mishap at Love Field? We already know there was one issue with who was going to be riding in Kennedy's car. Was it going to be Connolly, or was it going to be? Um, I think it's Yarborough. My oh uh, yeah, Ralph yeah. Ralph Yarborough was uh, <laughs> Ralph Yarborough hated. Johnson, and he hated Connolly. They were nemesis. They were longtime political enemies. Everybody in Texas knew that. Robert Yarborough represented the liberal wing of the Texas Democratic Party. And in Texas, when you call yourself a Democrat, most of Texas Democrats were going by their memory, going back to the Civil War, when the Democrats were the Republicans and the Republicans were the Democrats. But in Texas, that conservative Democrat idea, the ones who wanted slavery, the ones who were racist, the ones who were, you know, right wing, the Civil War Democrats were the Texas Democrats. And that's the Democrats that Connolly and Johnson came up through. And that's how you got elected as a Democrat. And that's why, that's why you chose the Democratic Party in Texas, not because you were liberal. Because Texans still like the old uh, right wing Democrats of the Civil War and identified with it. They were Southern, uh, <laughs> Southern Democrats, uh, which, you know, was also nicknamed the Dixiecrats. But the area was largely conservative at the time, mixed in with what we would call the big oil men, which would be hard right wingers. Yeah, keep that in mind. Texas, since the Civil War was always conservative, but why was it Democrat? Why was it Democratic Party? Because <laughs> that's how you got, that's how people identified politically, that's how you got elected. You ran as a Democrat so you could get those conservative Texas Democratic votes. Um, well, what's confusing to a lot of people whenever you mention the big oil men of Texas, um, I guess people examine it like how if someone had a billion dollars today, but you got to kind of examine it like it was like the Wild West if you were that billionaire type. You were like everyone kind of knew who you were. It's kind of like the mob walking around. Like people know who you are not to mess with you. 
because you have this reputation. And that was like that with Texas with their big oil people, Harold Byrd and many others were no names at least. And that's why I like understanding more about LBJ and his background politics is important of the way he kind of did business and the way he played dirty. Uh, it was effective, but also when you're entering his home state or his place and there's all these big oil people there, you can start understanding why so many people suspect that LBJ had Kennedy killed. I don't, like I said, I don't believe it. I think he was part of the cover up, but I think those big oil connections aren't as insane as when I first heard it. Oh yeah. Johnson had all the oil connections in politics at that level. If you wanted to, if you wanted to rise and become president, you need, you need votes, you need power, you need money. He got his money through his oil billionaire friends. Uh, and we talk about D. Harold Byrd because he owned the Texas School of Depository building since the 30s. But there was also H.L. Hunt. He was hugely known. There was Clint Murkison, hugely known. These guys got their pictures on Time Magazine's cover all the time. Um, and they were known as the, the wealthy Texans. Um, you know, they were they were big in FDR's administration. It was around the time that FDR got in and started messing with politics that nationally the conservative tradition of the Democratic Party started to shift. And um, and so you couldn't you couldn't get those conservative votes anymore by calling yourself a Democrat, except in Texas. That continued in Texas. Texas was all, always status quo. Um, but nationally, it started shifting under FDR. The Democrats became the liberal party. The Republicans became the, the far right wing party. That all happened, you know, fairly recently from at the time of the Depression. Uh, before that, nationally, it was still Republicans good, Democrats bad. Uh, but <laughs> Democrats bad, Republicans good. Uh, I mean, Democrats good, Democrats bad remained in Texas. And still really largely does to this day. Um, although we became a red state uh, because of what happened after, you know, it finally started shifting. By the time Reagan got in, Connolly, it's actually John Connolly was the first major politician in Texas to switch parties. And then a, there was a lot of switching that went on. I guarantee you, if Johnson had lived longer and had stayed in politics, Johnson would have shifted to the Republican Party because that's where his identity was. That's where it shifted to. They, they ran in the party where they could politically get the votes and get the power. A party, what party they identified with was only about getting the power. Money was everywhere, uh, and that was in the oil in Texas. And so, see, LBJ, and he was a shady character anyway. Now, you're right. I don't, he could not be. If you're a smart plotter, you don't have your guy, your replacement guy. The guy's going to replace the guy you're going to kill. You don't have him involved in the plot. And at the presidential level, you got to have plausible deniability. He had to believably be able to say that he, because they didn't know if they were not going to, things could have gone wrong. They all could have gotten caught. They could have been put on trial. Uh, and the truth could have come out. So you got to protect them. Covert operations are all about plausible deniability. You, you compartmentalize. You don't give everybody the same information. Johnson didn't want the information. He knew he had plausible deniability. But at the same time, he was good friends with John Connolly. John Connolly is a different story. Um, George Michael Evigo, I talked about this before. George Michael Evigo did this great workshop at uh, the 1993 conference in Dallas where he talked about uh, uh, Connolly's controlling of the trip planning. He was given control of it early on, you know, April 63, and he he grabbed hold of it and he kept a hard grip on it and he elbowed and pushed and punched everybody else out of the picture, including Kennedy's aides, Secret Service. You know, he wrangled them all year long and he did it through his experience with managing power. And <clears throat> he maintained control of the trip. He got that motorcade to make that hairpin turn at Dealey Plaza. 
um, you know, people talk about the Dallas Citizens Council and and them determining that, you know, the last route of the motorcade. But it was Conley behind the scenes. And it's also through guys like Bill Moyers, who were directly work, still working for, for Johnson. But a lot of Conley people, when it looked, when it, when when Johnson finally got power, a lot of Connolly's people who there was a straight difference between whether you were a Connolly person or a LBJ person until Johnson became vice president, and then a lot of Connolly people said, "Okay, we'll join together." A lot of Connolly people went on. People like Jack Valenti became LBJ guys. People like uh, Bill Moyers. Jack Valenti was part of the Hollywood production censorship offices that tried to censor films and things of that sort. Right. Yeah. Uh, Johnson made him the head of the Motion Picture Guild. Yeah. Uh, that was a reward for him coming up through power through Johnson. Uh, and, and after the Johnson administration went away and everything politically, that all of that was set aside. He continued his career in the motion picture business, but that was just the reward for that. Uh, Bill Moyers, you know, became a big deal in journalism. Um, you know, they all got their little rewards and their little pieces of power from having been associated with Johnson. Um, and so back to the original idea, Johnson had plausible deniability. They knew he was going to help with the cover up. Um, he could not know the details of the plot or the timing of it or what was going on. He couldn't get updates on the plot. He had a general idea, though, because he knew they were planning the trip. He knew they were planning the motorcade. Are we going to have a motorcade? All these questions. Evica does a brilliant job of detailing all of that. Johnson kind of was, you know, apprised of, he was even in on meetings. There was a meeting in El Paso in June about the Dallas trip, he knew the general outlines of what was happening, and he knew Connolly was in on the plot. He knew Connolly was a plotter, but he was not involved. He would like go to the meeting. He would Connolly would come see him at the White House. Con, uh, Connolly would come see him at the ranch. He would get updates. Connolly would leave. Johnson was given rough outlines as the plot was coming about because he had to be protected from knowing about the plot. His role, because his role would come after the assassination, he had to manage the cover-up from the beginning. Now, I was just interesting, I was just reading Richard E. Sprague's book, which you can find online now, uh, The Taking of America, one, two, three. Now, that book came out in the early 70s. And he talks about, he calls it, I was looking for the origin of the phrase power control group, which you heard Mayor Brussel talk about. Um, but it came from Sprague. Sprague coined the term power control group. That's an, another early term for deep state. We call it the deep state now. Uh, but Richard Sprague coined it as the power control group. And you read his little chapter, his little definition of the power control group. And you're re it's like you're reading today's definition of the deep state. And he includes the media and all, everything. He says that there was a, it's a continuum. We shouldn't think about a conspiracy to assassinate and then a conspiracy to cover it up. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't suddenly get the idea to cover it up after they succeeded in killing him. That was a continuum. The plan to cover it up was already in place. And that was going to be Johnson's job. Uh, but guys like Connolly... They knew all the details of the planning. Uh, they probably didn't know who the shooters were, but they knew there were, Conley, Conley knew there were going to be sharpshooters. And that's why he tried to get out of the limo the night before. He and Johnson, <laughs> they had a big argument. People heard this argument going on. That's how we know about it. And Kennedy refused to budge because it was, it was really nonsense. It was just a last desperate effort to see if they could force Kennedy to get Conley out of the car and put their enemy, Ralph Yarborough, in the car with Kennedy. They'll, and maybe we'll get a bonus and get and kill. Or maybe... Was this the one at Love Field? What? There was an argument at Love Field where 
about well, Connolly. Well, there were lots of arguments, lots of chaos and arguments in left field, but this was the one at the um, Hotel Texas in Fort Worth the night before. Okay, I'm not familiar with that one because the conversation that happened at Love Field is a little bit different. The conversation at Love Field was about Yarborough wanted to ride with Kennedy and Connolly didn't care, but Johnson was trying to lobby for Yarborough to ride with Kennedy, but Kennedy was keeping Yarborough in Johnson's car because he knew it upset Johnson. So it doesn't make Kennedy necessarily look good, but I'm sure throughout their whole administration, they both had a tick for tack on each other, trying to make themselves a little bit worse for the wear. Yeah, I've never heard it put quite that way. I'd like well, to, that's based to... on the documentation I can read, and the same documentation that also lists about how the uh, motorcycle cops were behind Kennedy's uh, wheels. The they they described it as Kennedy doesn't like the sound of motorcycles. He thinks they're loud and obnoxious, and that they want to. All of that the... is not. I don't know what document that is. I'd like to see that document because that's all. That was all made up. That's all false. Yeah, uh, it's ridiculous to think that a president can make demands of his Secret Service protection. Oh, I'm I'm sure that's what they told with the official narrative. But I'm I think the Yarborough conversation is probably pretty close to accurate. I think Kennedy probably wanted to keep Yarborough in that car for a reason. It was because it was to piss off Johnson. If you know. If you know the rivalry between Yar Yarborough's wing of the party and Johnson Connolly's wing of the party, if you know the argument that took place the night before at the Texas Hotel, none of that, there's no way, there's absolutely no way that Yarborough would have even had the idea to be in the limo with Kennedy. It just wasn't done. Uh, it was not protocol. So he would have chose he would have chose the limousine with he wouldn't have even Johnson? suggested it. The idea would have never even occurred to Yarborough to do that. It would have occurred to Conley and Johnson because Conley knew he was going to be in the line of fire because he put the limo in that spot for that reason. He spent the whole year doing it, uh, and he, even though you know he did it knowing that. You know, these are going to be sharpshooters. They know what they're doing. They're just going to hit Kennedy, and that, that'll be done. That's why when Conley was hit, he said, my God, they're going to kill us both. He yelled that out. Witnesses close by heard it. I don't think he said, my God, they're going to kill us both. I think he said, they're going to kill us all. Yeah, they changed it to they're going to kill us all. And you when can did hear they why. change it? Uh, they changed it very quickly, like uh, within a week. Uh, you know, they they straightened. They told they told Conley, you know, just change that last word. Uh, we can't have you saying we can't have the witnesses telling the truth about what you said in the car. So you know, and you know, within a week after the assassination, a lot of things started shifting like that. Conley's first description of his movements in the limousine were very different from his hospital bed when they interviewed him on film. Uh, my essay that's on Substack about the Zapruder film, Z film, Red Frame, White Light, is about how Conley, Conley changed his story to match the Zapruder film about his movements and the timing of his shot. That's what they edited out of the film. And of course, when they edit Conley's shot out of the film, you have to edit out other things including Kennedy movements. And that essay is all about, you know, witnesses saw these movements. You don't see them in the film today, but at all the timing happened at frame 227, which was the shot to Connolly. Um, so a lot of things were changing within a week after when they were getting their story straight uh, and they were faking the Zapruder film. They Things had to change. But yeah, Connolly was heard to say, my God, they're going to kill us both. Because he knew, he knew uh, when he was hit, he said, oh, well, dummy me, you know, I thought I didn't, because they weren't going to accidentally shoot anybody. These are sharpshooters. They were aiming. They had all day to aim. They had all, they said they were out there during the week lining up their shots, at least. And so these are professional snipers. They know how to set things up like this. And uh, so, yeah, 
Conley was no dummy. Conley knew the minute he was hit, he, he knew that he was uh, a target on purpose. Because, you know, they immediately start, the people who know the most about the conspiracy, they, they immediately, especially if you're boots on the ground in the conspiracy, uh, you, have, you are targeted. You are, uh, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, not even maybe a year or two from now, but you are designated to be killed. You won't know when or how you'll be killed, but you will be killed. If you were on the ground and you have the greatest danger of exposing the conspiracy, if you are caught, you will be killed. Uh, and they did that with the Kennedy shooting and with the Tippett shooting. Uh, it's just the way things are done. Um, and so Conley knew that's why he was hit. But he miraculously survived it because of the way he fell over pressed against his wounds in a way that allowed him not to bleed out. <clears throat> and he got to Parkland Hospital in better shape than obviously Kennedy, and he was a healthy guy, and they pulled him through, and he used that for the rest of his life. He used that to blackmail the other conspirators, and as it was his insurance for him and his wife, even after he died, it was his in, his wife's insurance because he hid away the truth in a way, and he made sure his fellow conspirators knew, um, you know, if if you come after me again, if you do anything to me, this is going to come out. We'll blow the whole lid off everything. So that was his insurance, and that's why he was rewarded with being on Nixon's short lift to replace Spiro Agnew when Agnew had to resign for corruption. And they needed a new vice president. Conley was on. Nixon wanted Conley to be his replacement as president. Even as late as 60 years ago, uh, 50 years ago this year, was the, the fall of Nixon and the resignation of Nixon. I'm, I'm sure it was because I, I don't necessarily think it was um, a good decision by Nixon to do that. But I think it's because Spiro Agnew was targeted, taken out first, and then they took out Nixon. I do believe Nixon was targeted. I don't know why out of that whole era we just talk about Nixon like nobody ever did anything bad back then. I'm also not a Nixon supporter. I don't think Nixon should have stayed in office. But Spiro Agnew, if you look at like his comments – uh, when people, the press, made comments about Nixon, they were talking about Nixon in such horrible ways. And Spiro Agnew was like the bulldog. And he's been referenced as that of like attacking the press about what their statements were for Nixon. And I feel like he just had to go. Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> he called them the, the nabobs of negativity. Yeah. That's, yeah. The nattering nabobs of negativity. Nattering. I was trying to remember that. The nattering nabobs of negativity. Yeah, he was a character. Um, From Maryland. As vice president. Go. I mean, you, know, you never hear Kamala Harris say much of anything. No, she just straight. witch cackles in this weird way. <clears throat> but uh, back then you had guys that were characters as vice president. Going back to John Nance Garner, who was uh, FDR's first vice president, Texan, guy from Texas, John Nance Garner, a guy that Kennedy uh, revered and went to visit him just like for his birthday in November of 63. One of the last official acts of Kennedy was to go visit John Nance Garner. Um, but uh, yeah, so so now Connolly did not become vice president for Nixon, although Nixon wanted it badly. Uh, it became um, Gerald Ford. And then Gerald Ford had to pick a vice president and he picked Nelson Rockefeller. The Rockefellers were always in the background of all of this. I think Nixon's move of choosing Gerald Ford was a really bad decision because that was Hoover's like go-to guy was Ford or inside man, I should say. If we talk about work on the Warren Commission and plus Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon. I think that was just payment for that. Like you're not going to stay in office, but I'm going to pardon you. Well, no, no, it wasn't. It wasn't, but it wasn't Ford's idea to reward Nixon, uh, Ford was picked to do that. Uh, and if Nixon wanted Connolly to be his replacement, why did he pick Ford? He was told to. He was said, you know, they were still a little scared of Connolly. Uh, Ford's a guy we can trust. Ford will do what we tell him to do. 
I do believe that. I think that was a move by Hoover and others to orchestrate that and get Gerald Ford as president. But the issue is, why do you think Nixon never said anything? He had dirt on everybody. He could have easily blown the whistle on J. Edgar Hoover. He could have done any of that. That's like the age-long question of why he didn't choose to expose or say anything. And the only thing I can think of is that Nixon's a bit of a Boy Scout like go by the rules type in this in the sense of like government is government and i'm not going to expose them he could easily put out the government secrets but he didn't do it because i guess maybe he didn't want to be the president that did that but he could have easily done it you know you, you, in the old in the old tradition the old mindset of the boy scouts you know the idea of that you're a goody two shoes if you're a Boy Scout. That's all gone away. The Boy Scouts have been completely devastated. Oh, 100 percent There's a new documentary about all the scandals that yeah, they yeah. had on. So yeah, so there's that today. But there's also the, there was always this idea that the Boy Scouts, people who knew the negative side of the Boy Scouts, always knew them as more like the Hitler youth. They were like the Americanized version of the Hitler youth. That's how you tr you train from a very early age to go into the military, and they're groomed. Uh, be, a good, be a good soldier. Yeah, you can sometimes go to the best Ivy League schools. Then you join the secret society so societies like Skull and Bones, and next thing you know, you get into a position of power, and you wonder why the whole thing is like a damn frat club. And in the sense of that negative view of the Boy Scouts, yeah, Nixon was a Boy Scout. Nixon was a Hitler Youth Boy Scout. Nixon was a Nazi. You know, he knew all about paperclip. Uh, he was cronies with Hoover. He went to, he was in on all the, the poker games where they talked about all the secrets, you know, the setup for Pearl Harbor, all, all of the ho most horrible. So why didn't he expose it? Because he was not, he was not a good Boy Scout. He was a bad Boy Scout. He was one of them. Now, of course, there's no honor among thieves. There's no honor among conspirators. You know, they start, you know, the conspiracy breaks itself into factions. You know, they're all together when they're all beyond the same goal. But before they plotted a conspiracy together, they were, they had their rivalries. You know, Clint Murkison and, and H.O. Hunt, I was recently telling people about this when the Kansas City Chiefs won the Super Bowl. Uh Kansas City Chiefs have always been in the family of the Hunts, the Dallas Oil Hunt family. Lamar Hunt um, was the, the creator of the Dallas Texans in 1959, the same year that Clint Murkison created the Dallas Cowboys. They were rivals. Um, and, you know, the Texans were um, uh, AFL and the Cowboys were NFL. And, you know, it's like this town's not big enough for both of us. And so it was a hunt that won and stayed in Dallas with the Dallas Cowboys. And Lamar Hunt was kicked out and moved him to Kansas City and renamed them the Chiefs. Um, so the Murkisons, the Cowboys were the Murkisons, the, Ch the Chiefs were the Hunts. Uh, and they were, they, so, but they get together right after, and it was in May. Of 1963, that Lamar Hunt and his team were kicked out of Dallas. Uh, of course, he had plenty. The Hunts still stayed in Dallas. They were a Dallas-based oil hierarchy, you know, uh, power group. And so were the Murkisons, and so so was uh, the Harold Bird. <laughs> they were all Dallas. Dallas was the conservative headquarters for everybody. Uh, you know, there, Houston had its versions but dallas was the banking community dallas was the federal reserve city uh that's where all the money was was in dallas um but so they 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 spent the rest of 63 you know <laughs> the kansas city chiefs are now in kansas we only have one team in dallas by uh, clint murkison but those guys got really busy on the conspiracy after that i had a lot to do the rest of that year uh, and they worked together. They succeeded in killing Kennedy. They succeeded in the cover-up. And then they, after that, they get back to their football. And they went on and they created the Super Bowl. It was, um, 
you know, Tex Schramm, who was the manager of the Cowboys, uh, created the Super Bowls. But you're losing me in some of these tangents there, Rich. Lamar Hunt name he actually Lamar Hunt coined the name the Super Bowl. That's the other great thing you'll read about Lamar Hunt, the founder of the Kansas City Chiefs, as the Dallas Texans. Lamar Hunt named the Super Bowl. Uh, so we we celebrate the Super Bowl every year now. It's the most watched TV event in history this year's, and the Kansas City Chiefs, the Hunt's team, won the Super Bowl. And, uh, you know, it's a thing. The Super Bowl is a huge All thing. right, I'm taking you off your tangent. You've gone on long enough. Um, i got to ask you about the number of interviews you've have done with certain individuals or what you would call researchers that have given you the perspective that you have or at least helped you. Maybe it might be some more memorable experiences that you could possibly share. Whoa, well. You've mentioned we one about the chair that you're sitting in, but you haven't mentioned – you've mentioned a few names, and you've talked about them, and I've never heard their names before. So I'm curious if their work – why you respect their work so much and if you're ever able to interact with certain researchers. Well, we mentioned Earl Golds. Earl Golds, G-O-L-Z, was a great reporter on the ground in Dallas at the time of the assassination, did initial reporting on it. He was one of the guys like Seth Cantor. Uh, I never knew Seth Kenner. Seth Kenner is the guy that saw Jack Ruby at Parkland. Yeah. Uh, he went on to write a book about Jack Ruby. Uh, Earl Goals, though, he stayed as a reporter in Dallas, uh, and he continued to follow up on Kennedy assassination stuff. You know, he's got his paper. I don't know where his papers ended up when he died, but, you know, you'll find all kinds of articles for decades about the assassination by Earl Goals. He was considered one of the great reporters on the subject, and he would go back to it. His editors never encouraged it. Nobody ever at the papers, especially in Dallas, nobody ever encouraged them to write stories on this. But they knew the public would be interested in it. They'd sell newspapers. And so they kind of begrudgingly let people like Earl Golds, you know, write up his story. But they had to be exactly accurate and true. and. Um, and Earl Goals was, uh, and it was Earl Goals by 1989, was it 88? I'll, I'll learn all these dates again when I read Admitted Assassin, the new book on the Roscoe White. Uh, as, um, That's an area we can touch on if you know a lot about Roscoe. I, I need to refresh my memory on that. That's why I'm going to, and, and I'm going to read Ricky White's book coming out, Admitted Assassin. Gary Shaw, the great researcher Gary Shaw, still alive, still in Cleburne, outside of Dallas. Uh, he's the main author. So if you try to find it, just look up Gary Shaw, Admitted Assassin. But it was co-authored by Ricky White, Roscoe White's son, who found, basically the story is, Ricky White, Roscoe White's son, uh, found a canister, a military-style canister, uh, like I think it was an ammo canister. Uh, just winging it here on top of my memory, I'm going to get a lot of things wrong. I used to know all the details about this because it happened right, right here. He found it in the attic of their family home in Paris, Texas, which is uh, east of Dallas. And it had documents. It had cables from his CIA handlers. It had... Uh, Never before seen backyard photos of Oswald, the, the ones that Oswald called fake. Uh, never before seen versions of, of those photographs were in that canister. The documents were, were authentic. They, they proved to be authentic. They were, either, they were either perfect fakes or they were authentic. It went back and forth. Still does in some circles, but I think we know enough now to know that Everything that Roscoe White hid away in that attic was authentic. Uh, he, that was his insurance. We talked about, this is a good time because we talked about how kindly the conspirators had these little pieces of insurance. They kept whatever they could, you know, some as souvenirs, but also mainly as insurance where, you know, they knew that if you were boots on the ground, you were a target. You were to be killed. So a lot of them protected themselves in this way, where they would tell 
they would let people know that they were associated with in the conspiracy that, you know, you might not want to mess with me because uh, I've arranged for things to come out if anything happens to me. And that's really good insurance among, you know, criminals. Uh, and that's what Roscoe White did. And when his son found this canister, he didn't know what to do with it. Uh, and so he started talking to his mom and his mom verified a lot. His mom worked for Jack Ruby at the time. Roscoe White worked for the Dallas Police Department at the time. We're going back to Dallas is rolling all this. Uh, Roscoe White was based at Atsugi, Japan, uh, at the uh, U2 facility, They're the same place that Oswald was. You know, Roscoe White knew Lee Harvey Oswald, and he became, he was placed at the Dallas Police Department. There are memos, there are documents that are telling Roscoe White, okay, you're in place, stay there. You know, the, and even after the assassination, they told him, stay in place for now. We'll let you know when to move on. Incre it's an incredible story. And Earl Gulls, somehow, I forget how he found out about this. Earl Gulls, at the, who was at the Austrian American Statesman by then, he, and, and also this story was being um, researched by the Assassination Information Center in Dallas. Uh, Larry Howard's and Gary Shaw's um, outfit in Dallas that they formed just off of Dealey Plaza there in the West End. Um, and it was kind of a walk-in place. They set up exhibits. They talked about the conspiracy. Um, and they had people walk in off the streets. And Ricky White did one day. And so they got the story from Ricky White first. That's Then I think Earl Goals picked it up from them. Earl Goals convinced his editors that this was worth reporting on. And it came out in the Austin American Statesman. It debuted front page, top half front page headline news, Roscoe White, uh, assassin of President Kennedy, blah, blah, blah. So then everything blows up and it, everything's huge for a while. And this is around the same time. This is late 80s when... I don't quite remember if it happened, if Earl Gulls came out with this before I knew about the Rambler or just after, but it's happening at the same time. And I'm, this is affecting my thinking because I, I find this Rambler on the campus of the UT and it looks like whoever had this Rambler was, knew something about Roger Craig seeing a getaway car that looked like this Rambler. You know, I knew that much, but I said, there's no way this is that car. This is somebody just like doing a cosplay kind of a thing with his car. But then when the Ricky White story started blowing up and I'm thinking, oh, my God, this guy who was a Dallas cop who may have been one of the shooters uh, leaves, uh, leaves behind documentation that he was one of those shooters uh, that anybody could find and then look at it and see the truth. And I'm thinking... My God, what, what if that's what George Wing is doing with his car? And it was at that point, it was months after I saw the car, that something encouraged me to take a deeper look into that car. So I started looking into that car the way they were looking into Roscoe White's background and his documents and artifacts. And I started finding the same kind of thing. Everything started piecing together. So, you know, it's like it, it made sense to me. And that's what. I, I pretty much think it was the Ro the Roscoe White story. That story stuck with me big time. In fact, when I was working at UT at the time, my boss, that I, I'd already been there like eight, nine years, and so I knew my boss really well. I'm the assistant director of my department. Uh, I knew both of them really well. But my boss, the top director, David Price, was from Paris, Texas. He grew up in Paris, Texas. And so... In 1991, this is all still playing out, and the, the Oliver Stone film, we've just learned that that's coming out. Uh, and so I'm talking to my boss, and I'm saying, you know, what do you think about this Roscoe White thing? In Paris? Do you ever hear about the White family in Paris, Texas? Here's their house. We know where they live. This is the attic they found this in. And I'm just like chatting over coffee with my boss one day. And I said, uh, you know, did you know this family? And he said, 
you know, they, they ring a bell, but I'll, I'll check with my friends and everybody in my family in Paris. I'm going to be going up there soon. So in 91, he takes a vacation and he goes back home to Paris, Texas. And he said, I'll look into it when I'm up there. Well, so he comes back and he finds out, yeah, it all makes sense. It all rings true. I wanted to ask, because like during the investigations of the HSCA and things like the Assassination Records Review Board and also filing your own Freedom of Information Act requests, I mean, have you filed significant amounts or just any amounts of Freedom of Information requests when it comes to the assassination of President Kennedy? And what was the difficulties dealing with that? Yeah, I, I never went uh, national. I never went with a federal. I learned how to do it. I had friends who were doing it. And they were more than happy to file for things that I was interested in. So I never had to do it myself. But I did go through Texas Open Records Act. I did a lot of that. And that's how I, because I, I was still investigating George Wing and the Rambler. That was my main area. And so I could get that stuff. I had to get stuff out of UT about George Wing. And I did it through Texas Open Records Act. Um. So I did it on a state level, but I had close friends who were doing getting all this stuff on a national level. I knew other researchers in other parts of the country who were big time um, FOIA activists and researchers, and they were compiling tons of documents, and they still have them today. Um, so I didn't feel like a strong need. There was nothing on the federal level, you know, and I didn't have time for that anyway. I, so. I was I was doing my own basic research, and I was doing analysis. I, I consider myself an an analyst of the research, the best research that everybody else did. Um, I told somebody recently, you know, they talked about the piles of data about a certain area of the assassination or whatever, and I said, you know, piles of data are only as good as their analyst. And that's true, I think. And so I've taken areas of the assassination. I've analyzed the data that exists. I, I didn't have to dig it up. I, I would maybe dig up a tidbit here and there, or I'd verify something. But uh, I, I would always do more verification of other people's data, and mainly analysis of it, because it's the, in the analysis uh, that you either get to the truth or you get to the furthering the lies. You know, everybody, everybody had ever told a lie about the Kennedy assassination. They did it under the guise of having analyzed it. So, you you know, it's all about how you analyze it. It's not about the data itself. It's how you analyze the data. Well, what data is correct and what data isn't? That's, that's how you, that's where the analysis comes in. You have to, you have to verify the data. Uh, I know, but give me some know. data that you've been able to find that was incorrect. That was incorrect. It's clearly, you recommend or you talk about the work of Nathan Derby. So a lot of people would consider yeah, Darby, but a lot of people would consider that a terrible, uh, useless crackpot of a person. But it seems like you're very confident in his skills and determinations that the fingerprints that were found on the sixth floor were Mac Wallace's. Excellent example, because Thanks. I was in the middle of that. I was in the middle of that, and uh, I had already published my first major monograph about the Rambler, and so I'll, I had a reputation of being a good researcher. John Judge publicly called me one of the best researchers in Texas, and uh, so you know I was risking. You're always risking your reputation as a researcher. Um, and so you have to nail it down, if, especially if you're directly involved, like I was with the fingerprints. Um, and so I decided, all right, I don't know who the, if I didn't have the name Nathan Darby for, for a long time, uh, he didn't, he didn't, Jay Harrison, who was running this investigation for Bar McClellan here in Austin, and the guy who contacted Nathan Darby, um, and got the match, fingerprint match done, um, Jay Harrison did not tell me the name of his examiner. All he did was he, he gave me the print cards and the match, and I could see the points of match. And I didn't really even care who the examiner was. All I cared about was 
is this a match? Now, I already had, Barbara McClellan gave me the FBI's manual on fingerprint science. And he said, read this, uh, study it. You're going to be our uh, troubleshooter on the fingerprints. Uh, let us know if we do anything wrong. Let us know if anybody lies about what we've done. And so I studied it. I gave it a hard study. And my first test was to use those techniques and see if I could see the match myself. And if I could not see the match, I was going to step away from it, you know, partly to protect my, the reputation I already had as a good researcher, but also because, you know, it's nonsense. Uh, if this is not a match, I don't care what Jay Harrison believes. I don't care who the examiner was. I don't care what Barr McClellan believes. It's all going to collapse at the house of cards. So I had to nail that down. And so I used my new knowledge about fingerprint science. I looked, I studied those matches, and I could see them. And then after that, for another year or two after that, I continued to, to study those fingerprints. And I eventually met Nathan Darby, sat down with him on the sofa in Don Meredith's living room, and we compared our notes. I had my charts. He had his chart. He had already gotten up to 34 points of match by that time. And I had actually found 10 of those. So we, we hit it off really well. He was all about the science and the match. And he was appreciative that I wasn't about writing a book. I wasn't about, you know, doing a documentary. I wasn't about, you know, getting some kind of celebrity or anything. He knew that I was, all, I was also all about the match. Because I had found 10 of the same matches that he found. And um, as an amateur, I was able to do that, which told me that I had really understood this and I had a knack for seeing it. Um, and so we hit it off. And I can tell you, there is no more straight, old school, honest, straightforward, true Boy Scout than Nathan Darby. Asa Nathan Darby is a true American hero. He was before the assassination. He was before the fingerprint match. And he remains so posthumously today. Um, he's one of the great heroes in the Kennedy assassination for making that match and having the courage to sign his name to that match and go public with it. Uh, he knew the dangers of that. Two other examiners had already said no. They were scared to death or their spouses were scared to death. They stepped out of it. Nathan Darby had the guts and the courage to put himself out there as the fingerprint examiner on the Malcolm Wallace fingerprint match of a fingerprint found in the FBI files where the FBI claimed it was on one of the boxes on the sixth floor. Um, and that's as far as I will go. That's as far as the data will take me. Now, this is, this is another thing about that data. Everybody you talk to, almost everybody you talk to about the fingerprint data, Malcolm Wallace, even if they buy the truth of it, that it's a match, that it is Malcolm Wallace's fingerprints, they will say, ah, this puts him on the sixth floor. Nonsense. My analysis says that this takes you only as far as the FBI file at the National Archives, where you could have easily planted that fingerprint. Uh, so then you have to ask, well, why would they plant the fingerprint of Malcolm Wallace in the FBI's official file of the prints taken off of the boxes on the sixth floor if they weren't on the boxes on the sixth floor? That's a good question. And that's where your analysis proceeds after that, because the evidence itself, the data itself does not take you to the sixth floor. It takes you to the FBI file at the National Archives. You can't jump beyond that to the sixth floor. So you analyze the evidence and only the evidence you have. You don't make things up. It's a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence. What about the evidence or data on the Clint Murchison party? That's, you know, I've talked about that here, saying that that's still very fuzzy to me. Not very fuzzy. I tend to go with it. I haven't looked at the data that closely. Uh, because, you know, it comes from one witness, which is Madeline Brown, but that's it. I need another person that saw it or was there to be able to confirm it. 
There's no documentation that there was well, there, a party. There is a, there's another person. Uh, watch, um, I forget which episode it is. It's not episode nine. That's all about Nathan Darby of the man who killed Kennedy. I think it's episode eight, maybe, uh, where they talk about the Murkison party. There was a, there was a driver. There was a, a chauffeur or somebody like that. Um, there were, uh, there was another one. There was like a maid. Uh, who verified some of Madeline Brown's stuff. So it's more than just Madeline Brown. But even if it's just Madeline Brown, you know, uh, I asked Ed Tatro to write the foreword of my book. Ed Tatro knew all the same people I knew, interviewed the same people I knew. He, and he's the only researcher I can say that about. So he was the perfect guy to write the foreword to my book. He understood me. I understood him better than anybody. Now, I, I never met Madeline Brown, but Ed Tatro considered her a surrogate mother. And Madeline Brown considered Ed Tatro a surrogate son. Now, say what you want about Madeline Brown. Uh, you know, I have my doubts about her, too, because she had an affair with Lyndon Johnson. I'm not judging her character. You just need more than one source. The only time it's ever been accepted throughout history has been on the Carl and Bernstein story, which was about the deep throat stuff. Yeah, my memory is even based on just that one hour episode of The Man Who Killed Kennedy is that there were a couple of other sources that they got to back up Madeline Brown. But when Ed Tatro tells me that Madeline Brown is completely trustworthy on that story, I have to listen to Ed Tatro. Now, that doesn't convince me, because then I would be practicing um, a logical bias, um, argument from authority. Uh, even somebody that I believe in and trust as much as Ed Tatro, uh, I'm not going to believe anything he tells me. I'm not going to believe anything anybody tells me. I'm going to have to at least back it up somewhat on my own, once again, analyzing the data. So Ed Tatro tells me that Madeline Brown is completely trustworthy about the Murkison story and everything she said about Johnson and every, all of that. And to me, okay, that's a good lead. I will take that and I will do my own research and verify that data as much as I can after that. But at least I know I'm not wasting my time. I'm trusting well enough to know that I won't be wasting my time looking into that. But I'm going to try to debunk it still. at the And, and I have, talking about what you disagree with, there are things that I disagree with Ed, Ed Tatro on. So I have no qualms about disagreeing with my good friend Ed Tatro about aspects of the assassination. We go on and on about the three tramps that they... Uh, detained in Dealey Plaza. Do you think one was uh, Howard I, Hughes? Or not Howard Hughes. Do you think one was Howard Hunt? Howard Hunt? No. See, Petro thinks one is Howard Hunt. He goes with the Canfield Leberman description. I go with Lois Gibson's. I, I was at her presentation. I, I was a trained visual thinker by then. I was following... I was probably the only one in that room of 500 people who was following all of Lois Gibson's scientific arguments about making those facial matches. Um, and I never doubted Lois Gibson after that. I've looked at it again. I've heard, you can find her presentation now on YouTube. Uh, but a lot, you know, anytime you're dealing with photographs, it comes down to what is your understand, what is your ability to think visually? What is your understanding of photogrammetry, the scientific study of photographs? And even Jack White, who did all the great photo analysis uh, of the Zapruder film and of Oswald, um, he didn't have a strong grasp on the science of photographs, and he slipped into uh, uh, the moon landing hoax after he got this huge, great reputation as a Kennedy analyst, as a Kennedy assassination researcher. He became a, a moon hoax backer because he couldn't understand the shadows in the moon photographs. He could understand shadows all day in Dealey Plaza and in his Bruder film, 
But when it came to the complexity of a smaller planet and no atmosphere and those complex perspectives and shadows, he was at a loss because he didn't understand the science of perspective, the science of photographic analysis. And he was a, he was a photographic uh, expert for the HSCA. You know, he had their reputation on the Kennedy assassination, but he was completely lost once he got into the moon landing photos. And so you have to have a good grasp and you have to have also a talent, a visual talent and a visual education of how to think visually to understand the science of photographs. So when we, when it comes down to photographs, I tend not to, to spend a lot of time arguing about it. When you talk about, you know, Oswald lookalikes, you talk about even the doppelgangers uh, based on photographs. You talk about, was he standing in the doorway based on photographs? And I just, I laugh when I read people's takes when they're trying to a analyze photographs like that. Um, because I see right away, they have no clue what they're doing when they're looking at a photograph. A photograph is not reality. We're learning that even still today. People are shocked to find out that you can now write out a series of text and, and AI will make a movie about it. Uh, did you see those on the news recently? Uh, but these were just short clips. Eventually, and Hollywood knows this already, Hollywood is scared to death, but, but the executives are excited because now the executives can have a screenplay. They can feed it into chat GPT or whatever the new AI is that comes out with a movie. Feed the, feed the script into the, the AI and it will spit out a fully done movie. It will take whatever it needs from the cloud and it will put together the entire movie from beginning to end that follows the script. That's what AI is able to do now. And people are amazed at this, but they were doing, you could do deep fakes like that back in the 60s. You, you know, the, there was a guy that said, photography was to the Cold War as code breaking was to World War II. So code breaking won World War II. If you know anything about the Enigma machine and how we broke the German code and how we broke the Japanese code, code breaking won World War II. We knew everything everybody was doing. This guy said that photography was to the Cold War what code breaking was to World War II. We won the Cold War based on our ability to analyze and fake photographs. So we were doing that in analog anyway. Deep fakes were very possible. Um, and only with our sophistication today can we see those flaws in the analog things like the Zapruder film. The Zapruder film was a very good deep fake. It was a very, it's one of the, the champion award-winning uh, analog deep fakes. But after digital photography came out in the late, I went to a seminar in like 1989. I went to a seminar at the campus of UT uh, about digital photography. It was something new. And as, as a professional artist and photographer at UT, we took this seminar and the guys explained to us, you know, this has been around in the military already now for like 10 years. And we know a lot about it. And he said, from this day forward, you will never be able to use a photograph you can always have a photograph used as evidence against you in court. You can always have that thrown out as evidence because from today forward, no one can trust a photograph. So photographs, are, we visual thinkers have always known that a photograph is just an illusion. It's a painting. It's no better than a drawing or a painting. But the public has always had in their minds that if I can see it in a photograph, it's real. If I can see it on TV, it's real. If I can see it on a movie screen, it's real. No, uh, visual thinkers have always known that there is a deception to all photography and all cinematography. Um, so, you know, you have to have all of this understanding going on at the same time. If you're going to argue about the photographs and the Kennedy assassination, um, so I don't bother with it because there's a thing called facial blindness. I've talked about that before here too. Uh, people are on a spectrum. Yeah, it's yet another spectrum, but it's a spectrum of being able to recognize somebody by their face. 
Facial blindness is the lower extreme of it where you you cannot absolutely cannot recognize somebody from one meeting to the next meeting from their face. You have to go by clear. Brad Pitt has it. Brad Pitt has it. Yeah, so there's facial blindness. 60 Minutes did an excellent little story on this. And there's um, there's uh, super recognizers. The other end of the spectrum is super recognizers. And there's a test you can take to see where you are on the spectrum. I took the test. I came out as a super recognizer, which you would think, because I'm trained in visual thinking, I also have always, in second grade, when it was discovered, I've had a knack for portraiture, which I developed into a knack for caricature. And caricature is all about nailing the likeness. So it didn't surprise me that I was a super face recognizer. I could, you know, I have like a 95% chance of recognizing you from a baby picture, certainly from a high school picture. Um, but there's also, so, so you never know who you're talking to. When you're arguing photographs, and doppelgangers or any photographs, really. You never know where they are on their knowledge of photographic analysis. You never know where they are on the facial blindness uh, spectrum. And so it's just, until you get all of that out of the way, you can't you know, analyze any data or argue any data. You have to know who you're talking to. Well, do you think it's important to examine the data now based on an article that you have on your Substack about deep time? Because obviously with the conspiracy and just the amount that keeps getting piled on top and piled on top and piled on top, I mean, we're 60 years in. And, you know, for a lot of people that have been there since the beginning and have watched it all unfold, you keep thinking the next year is going to be the year. But then what does it leave for the newer generation who's just largely disconnected from it? Even like my brother, I talked to him about it. He's like, I don't know who Jack Ruby is. So I was like, dude, you're 30 years old. How do you not know who Jack Ruby is? And you kind of realize that a lot of people ju just don't care about the event, younger generations. And it's like, well, then the conspiracy wins, right? The conspirators, the people that pulled this off, the ones that were able to buy it and just keep delaying and delaying and delaying without sparking up any inspiration. So I think at this point now – because of the mass amount of information that is out there about the Kennedy assassination, there needs to be look throughs about certain theories and certain ideas. And it's not challenging them, but it's about looking at the data of those things. If I can't prove by another source that Clint Merkinson's party did happen, it's not something that that's really worth discussing unless you're just already interested in the Kennedy assassination. It's like with those clips that we've been doing, I've really tried to raise everything and really try and look at things that, yes, everything has documentation to it. But when you really talk about the overall events and the amount of people that have examined this over the past 60 years, you're going to come up with a lot of weird connections and a lot of interesting things that necessarily might be far from the point, but could they be essential? Overall time wins. And so far, I don't think we're going to really see this thing last a lot longer. Maybe my generation, I might get some people hooked onto it, but a lot of the older folks are not going to be able to see the things that we might want out of getting Kennedy assassination-related documents and maybe a more thorough conclusion. Whether it is that there was a bullet that was placed on a stretcher by Paul Landis or something, even though I don't buy it, it sure is a hell of a lot better than the single bullet theory, which is that's what it is. Yeah, we know it's a conspiracy. Uh, but read my essay, The Guardian Knot. Um, and you can follow up on that and read Martin Schatz. I love how you think people read, man. I just love it. No, no, I'm, I know people don't read. I'm just saying read it. You know, I write. I'll I write read it personally, short. but if you're asking listeners to, good I, luck, dude. Fuck. I I write. Five I heard to you say minutes. fuck. I heard you say. <laughs> no, no. I write five to fifteen minute essays. My longest essay on there, maybe a half an hour. Uh, it's not like reading a book. I know. You know. Why don't you just do video clips? It. You should have done that a long time ago. Start your own YouTube. Um, it's not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But here, here's the deal. Jesus. You're I'm trying to give you advice here. Two and a half years, you're coming to the point where you see the futility. I'm tired of it is what I am. I am tired of it. I'm more interested in Howard Hughes now and the fact that Kennedy's dad owned RKO Productions. 
at one point before Howard Hughes ended. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're tired of it. Because I can't I can't understand why we're still sixty years into this. And we're still, you know, digging up data and analyzing it. I'm just surprised at the number of people that just don't have any knowledge or interest in any like don't know who Lee Harvey Oswald is. I thought his name would just be like Elvis. You just knew it. Yeah. Um, but then the number of people that will challenge you on your theory as well, too. Like I had a guy who thinks Johnson did it. And I was like, I don't think Johnson did it. He's like, and he got immediately got defensive. I was like, it doesn't eliminate the conversation or the friendship that we've had developing it and giving you the time on my show. But I just it's not my I don't think I can't get there yet. I haven't gotten there. I don't think there's evidence really to support it. I think there's something deeper. But I do think he was part of the cover up. It doesn't mean I disagree entirely. I'm still going to let someone explain themselves, but you, you, the community is just, it's too much for anyone to want to get interested. Yeah, look, we all have a right to our opinion. Yeah. But opinions themselves are not equal. We all have an equal right to our opinion, but opinions themselves are not equal. Informed opinions are better than uninformed opinions. So you have to immediately decide, am I discussing this with an uninformed person? Do they have an uninformed opinion or do they have an informed opinion? My first question to everybody is, what's your scholarship? And I find out real quickly, you know, whether they know who Lee Harvey Oswald, ever heard of Lee Harvey Oswald. What do you mean, what's your scholarship? Like, what's their educational background? What's your scholarship? That's such a shit question for judgment because some academics don't know anything out of their individual area all the guys that called themselves intellectuals in the beginning you just notice intellectuals can be wrong about anything as long as it sounds good you know they were all pushing eugenics in the beginning yeah um... saying it's a good idea do what they were wrong obviously but did we get hold them no because they're intellectuals and what they said sounds smooth and Joe, Joe Green wrote a brilliant essay about this in his tinfoil hat book uh, about how they use the term Occam's razor. These are code words. Uh, and I, I will admit that I purposely say, what's your scholarship as a vocabulary test right from the start? What it means is, what have you read? Uh, but if, if they don't understand what's your scholarship, that tells me, okay, that's, I'll need to bring it down another level. Now, Occam's razor is a sci- is a pseudo scientific term. A lot of people think it's a scientific term. They think it's a principle. They think it's a, a law or a principle. Occam's razor, which means uh, the simplest explanation is usually the best. Now that has been used as a weapon against JFK researchers, and Joe wrote all about this uh, to say, well, you know, the single bullet theory, um, the Kennedy assassination. You got to apply Occam's razor. It's the simplest explanation. Oswald did it. Uh, Occam's razor is nonsense. Occam's razor has never been a scientific principle. Uh, it applies in, in certain mathematical areas and in certain strictly scientific areas, but it doesn't apply to even sciences like psychology. When you get into human psychology, the complexity, the more complex explanation is usually the answer. And when you get into covert operations, Occam's razor is useless against a well-planned covert operation. Think of it like a magic trick. Occam's razor, you apply Occam's razor to a magic trick, and you're going to think, oh, my God, he just made that lady float up in the air. Of course, that's the answer. Uh, He has the power of levitation. That's Occam's razor which of course is nonsense, you get into the complexity of it. You say, okay, how did he do this? What was the trick? You apply Occam's razor to the trick, not to what you just saw with your own eyes. That's the way covert operations are. Covert operations are sophisticated magic tricks. And you do not apply Occam's razor to it, but that's used as a bludgeon against researchers. It always says from the beginning, oh, you're wrong. Oswald did it because of Occam's razor. You know, that's uh, that's that's not pseudo intellectualism. That's outright deceptive intellectualism. 
Well, finding a wrapping point here, what would you recommend to individuals out there when they're going to look into the Kennedy assassination and even recommend recommendations to other researchers who seem to have forgotten the essential point sometimes about what the assassination research focus was, what the particular goal is? Um, if, if you want to do the research, if you want to do the scholarship, if you know how to do research and scholarship, Use it as a way of learning how to do research and scholarship, how to do critical thinking. Um, any number of subjects can take you towards that. If you already know how to do, think critically and do scholarship uh, and you want to develop an informed opinion about the Kennedy assassination, have at it. Uh, do the work and develop an informed opinion. That was my initial goal, and I succeeded. Um, but that's that's all you can realistically expect. Um, what needs to happen now is we need to stop thinking that we are going to solve this problem because it's a false mystery. It's already been solved from the beginning. It's a false mystery. It's a waste of time. The reason we're 60 years in is because we wasted all this time thinking it was a mystery to be solved. And we're, some are still trying to solve it. What needs to happen is the investigation is over. We know what happened. We know enough about what happened. We're never going to know everything, especially on our own, because that's the nature of a conspiracy. A conspiracy is secret. And you never know everything about a conspiracy. The only way you can know about any of it in advance is to have somebody infiltrate it. Now, we have had the opportunity of talking to infiltrators in the Kennedy conspiracy, and that's how we know everything we know. But at this point, we don't, we'll, we'll never know everything on our own about the conspiracy, but we know who knows. And it's the criminals themselves. It is the power control group, the continuum. People today are part of that continuum. Kennedy's conspirators are living today. They're being recruited new generations. They are on the ground today, actively making this go on, the power control group. Now, they know. They know all the details. They are taught all the details. Those details exist, buried in 40 acres of underground, super secret caves under Washington, D.C., as John Judge told us. And so we get, they have the secret history. You know, they, they can easily take somebody aside at some special operation level a uh, special access program, you know, above, way above top secret, and they can give them a notebook. Go through this, you know, it proves the assassination. It's the basic history 101, what really happened to Kennedy. And, you know, that's how they recruit the new people and teach them because you cannot. And I was amazed to read that Richard E. Sprague in his book, The Taking of America, one, two, three. He said it in these words. He said, you cannot keep this a secret for generations without knowing the truth yourself. So, and he talked about how they do teach it to new people to keep it going. You cannot, you cannot lie about this for very long at all unless you know the absolute truth and you know what to lie about. Because eventually you forget what to lie about and the truth just comes out. How do you keep something, how do you keep a lie going for 60 years? Because you know all the details, and you know how to stop the truth whenever it starts to appear. And so I say, we need to get that secret history from the government. Don't waste our time thinking we're going to solve it and buy and have a have a you know a, a mass epiphany by the general public knowing about this. No. Once we force the government to tell the criminals themselves, force them to tell us what happened, make it official. Um, in my latest essay called uh, Many Theories and Single Bullets, I talk about how the whole idea of many conspiracies was a fake thing to begin with. So we need to force them to give us that secret history. How do we do that? That's what we should have been thinking about for 60 years. Some people have. Richard E. Sprague was thinking about it in the early 70s. But that's what we should focus on, getting them to tell us it's not our job to tell the rest of the public what happened. 
It's their job to tell us what they did. We are the, are, we have to, you know, arrest them. We have to take it from the investigated stage to the, um, to the trial stage. We have to put them on trial. Well, first we have to arrest them, and then we have to put them on trial. Now, how do we do that? Well, that's what we should be thinking about. And nobody has thought about that. And I admit that I've only, I've, th I've tried to think about it for years, but I can't do it on my own. I mean, I don't have, I don't have the expertise, <laughs> but that's, that's what I think about these days. And that's what I think we should be thinking about. It's how do we get that truth from the government? Because only after it's official will the general public go along with it because the, the general public tends to be authoritarian. They go with whatever's official. You see all the lies they buy every day. Uh, and you see the truths that they know. And they, the truths they know are because they are official. It's like, okay, the Kennedy assassination itself. I made this example in many theories and single bullets. The, uh, the church committee, the attempts to kill Castro, that was the same conspiracy. That was the CIA, the mob. Uh, it was oil men. It was the media all combined. It wasn't separate conspiracy theories. The church committee did not talk about all these conspiracy theories trying to kill Castro. It was one conspiracy, and they made it official, and nobody to this day tries to separate that conspiracy into many conspiracies because it's official. And I said, we need to do that for what Richard Nixon, here on President's Day, for what Richard Nixon called that Bay of Pigs thing, the Bay of Pigs thing was his code word for that same conspiracy directed towards Kennedy. I think Nobody he said fiasco. I don't think he used the word thing. The Bay of Pigs thing. No, he, no fiasco is something that from, from April 63, 61, they were calling it a fiasco. So that's where you've heard Bay of Pigs fiasco. No, I'm pretty sure Richard Nixon, when he states we don't want a repeat of the whole Bay of Pigs fiasco. I, I, I'll bet you a week's salary that he didn't say it that way. I'm not betting it's anything to you. Thing. I also have been up for 18 hours, and I just listened to you rant without dozing off. So The Bay of Pigs thing uh, is what Richard Nixon called it. We make that official. The general public will buy it. Why didn't he say anything? Why didn't he just toss it out there? Bill Clinton let everybody up when he was getting his whole thing going. Because he was headed to the execution chamber himself. These were traitors. Now, we already know Nixon was a traitor with the October Surprise, you know, the X-File. I wrote an essay about why is this man laughing? The essay about Richard Nixon as a traitor. Uh, they, they could argue this. They could subtly argue amongst themselves about this. They could not go public with it because they would end up being executed as a traitor. They would be hanged on the steps of the White House. Hmm. That's why Nixon didn't reveal it. Before you get me canceled off YouTube, let's just promote your links there, Richard. Yeah, substack.com. Uh, Bartholomew's at substack.com. Bartholomew's dot substack.com. Twitter? Uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm Bartholomew's Twitter. Uh, Bartholomew's Twitter. Bartholomew's Facebook. Um, you Google Bartholomew's, you'll find me all over the place. That's my... That's my brand name, Bartholomew. It's a good, good brand name. But I'll link all your links in the description. Richard, it's been a pleasure chatting with you again. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blake Podcast.